first century AD, Rome had emerged as Europe's sole superpower. And as the Romans expanded their empire outward, they also looked inward and used their superior engineering skills to improve the quality of life within the walls of the capital city. Of all the achievements of Rome's engineers, none were as life-altering as running water. Rome's system of water distribution was um, a quantum leap to anything which had come before it. In the capital city, 11 aqueduct lines guided a steady stream of fresh water to its citizens, carrying a combined 200 million gallons a day into the city from mountain springs miles away. So, so much water was available in the city of Rome, and this sustained an enormous population. The aqueducts fostered the growth of a new urban culture. With a constant stream of water, up to a million people were able to live cleanly and comfortably in the capital city. And it's the water from the aqueducts which can flush out the human filth and keep your city clean. Uh, this is another reason why the Romans think that they're superior. It's because they're cleaner than everybody else. No single emperor can claim credit for the success of the aqueducts. They were built over the course of several centuries. But it was the disfigured, stuttering Emperor Claudius who arguably had the greatest impact on Rome's water supply. Before he assumed power, Claudius had been a royal laughingstock who was considered an invalid and even hidden from the public eye. Claudius had a stutter, we hear. He had a little bit of a limp. Um, he was hard of hearing. So people didn't really know what to do with Claudius. In spite of his shortcomings, Claudius was cunning enough to seize power when an unlikely opportunity presented itself. In 41 AD, most of the royal family was murdered to avenge the bloody reign of Claudius's nephew, Caligula. But Claudius was spared after he was found cowering behind a curtain. With his life hanging in the balance, he managed to bribe Rome's Praetorian guards into proclaiming him emperor. His timely bribe would change the course of Roman history. Once he became emperor, he seems to have ruled in many ways, at least by our standards, well. He clearly was not a stupid man. During the reign of Claudius, the empire took several surprising steps forward. On the frontier, his legions conquered Britannia, something even Julius Caesar failed to do. And back home, he built two major aqueducts, the Aqua Claudia and the Anio Novus, which dramatically increased the amount of water flowing into Rome. Aqueducts are not that complicated in theory. That is that water uh, seeks its lowest level uh, and therefore that you can run water down a slope uh, from any area uh, to another area. Uh, so that that's a pretty simple premise uh, that everybody would have known. Uh, but that the practice of um, creating an aqueduct is another thing. The Romans engineered their aqueducts to approach the city on a gradual declining angle, or gradient. That gradient was just several inches every 100 feet. The slope of the aqueduct had to be calculated from great distances, uh, 20, 30, sometimes even 40 miles, uh, from the source in the mountains to the cities themselves. That had to be consistent. They couldn't deviate from it, regardless of what the terrain was. To maintain the water's precise descent through high mountains, Roman engineers dug perfectly angled tunnels through them. When the pipelines reached low valleys, they were elevated on stone walls. If the walls needed to be higher than six and a half feet off the ground, the Romans saved building materials while still adding strength by perfecting an ancient engineering concept, the arch. 
The art revolutionized architecture in the ancient world by permitting far greater spans than had been allowable before. They basically changed the spatial conception uh, totally of Roman architecture. Arches were built around a temporary wooden framework that held each stone in place until the keystone was laid in the center. The keystone evenly distributed weight down each side of the arch, allowing builders to stack additional stones above it. Arches are improvement upon building just a straight wall uh, in a variety of means, both in terms of their efficiency and in terms of their strength. The arch, of course, takes much less material to build. Arches are very strong at supporting things like roofs and aqueducts and whatever you want to put on top of them. A six-mile column of arches carried the Aqua Claudia across the valleys on its way to Rome. The aqueducts would have had a covered roof, but of course if you could take the roof off, you could see the water like an open river coming down towards the city. After reaching the city, each aqueduct emptied into three holding tanks. One for the public drinking fountains, a second for the public baths, and a third reserved for the emperor and other wealthy Romans who paid for their own running water concept that was well ahead of its time. Basically every home by the first or second century AD of any means had running water. This is astounding because the entire span of the Middle Ages they didn't have this. With the construction of the Aqua Claudia and the Anio Novus, Emperor Claudius had revitalized Rome's system of water distribution. His public record was one of success, but the choices he made in his private life would ultimately lead to his downfall. The tradition about Claudius is that he was uxorious, that he loved his women and his wives in particular too much, and was subservient to them. He sent shockwaves through the empire when he married his own niece, Agrippina the conniving sister of Caligula. Agrippina came from a line of ambitious, uh, popular, and powerful women. She was kind of in some ways the Cleopatra of her age. She was headstrong, she was proud, and she was ambitious. She was terribly ambitious. After having been surrounded by emperors her whole life, Agrippina was hungry for her own taste of power. She used all of her physical and political charm to attain it. And once the aging Claudius was under her spell, she used her only son as a means to perpetuate it. Agrippina's main intent in seducing Claudius and becoming the empress was to ensure that her son would uh, accede to the throne. In 50 AD, Agrippina convinced Claudius to name her son from a previous marriage as his heir instead of his own biological son. Four years later, Emperor Claudius was dead, poisoned by a mushroom and his wife's ambition. Overnight, Agrippina had gone from being the wife of one emperor to the mother of another. His name was Nero, a 16-year-old tyrant in training who had engineered disaster. Sixty-four A.D. A small fire spreads into a week-long inferno that reduces huge swaths of Rome to ashes and leaves thousands homeless and walking the streets. The fire 64 was one of the most devastating fires that Rome ever had. And we hear that of the 14 regions of Rome, at least 10 were affected, some completely destroyed. That must have been um, a huge number of, of individuals who were killed in the panic and in, in just being killed by smoke or by the fire itself. Number one on the list of arson suspects is the emperor himself. 
Nero was supposedly seen playing his lyre at the top of a nearby tower as the fire raged. He's said to have looked at the fire as though it were a spectacle and to have gone to the Tower of Mycenaeus and recited the fall of Troy. The tradition is that Nero was fiddling while Rome burned. His actions after the blaze were just as incriminating. Nero confiscated a third of the charred city as his own personal property and set out to build the empire's most extravagant monument to self-indulgence, a palace complex.